So I just want to add a little bit to uh, where we left off about uh, spiritual mentors this morning and then go into uh, Nagarjuna. So, um, yeah, like I said this morning, we don't feel like you have to agree with every conventional opinion or idea that your teacher has, you know. Like I was saying, you don't have to drink Tibetan tea if you don't want to. And, you know, people have different ways of, of running their lives. You know, one of my teachers likes to start teachings at 10 on an early night and midnight and normally. And I like to be in bed by 10 o'clock and I don't do well staying up at night. Uh, but it doesn't mean what my teacher is doing is wrong. It's just he has a different way of living life than I do. And that's okay because people have different ways. Their bodies function in, in different ways. They have different ways of doing things. Yeah, so that, that's okay. The, the thing we want to avoid is this, is, uh, this picking faults and criticism and um, deprecation you know, having a really negative mental state towards somebody uh, who we have chosen as one of our, our spiritual mentors. Yeah. So first, before making somebody one of our teachers, we need to check them out, okay? Because who you select as one of your spiritual mentors is more important than who you marry. And you don't just, well, hopefully marry somebody after you just meet them. Uh, yeah, some people do, but, uh, okay, so you check out somebody's qualities first, but then once you see, you know, that they're an ethical person, they have meditative experience, they know the teachings well, they're compassionate, they're kind, you, then you make the choice that they become one of your teachers. After that, then you don't want to sit there and be critical and pick faults because like I said this morning, the danger is then you say, oh, well, they really don't know what in the world they're talking about. And so, uh, you know, this Dharma business, Buddhism business is all for the monkeys. Goodbye. Okay. And then that is incredibly dangerous. Yeah. Because then you abandon the whole Dharma and how are you going to make spiritual progress if you do that? So that's going to adversely affect many, many, many lifetimes. Okay, but if, you know, ways, ways of living, if your teacher likes to, you know, have gazillions of flowers in the garden, but you would rather, you know, you think it's better to spend the time studying, uh, that's okay, you know. And if there's another student who wants to put the gazillion flowers in, that, that's okay. And, you know, everybody gets along. So, um, you know, you, you in general try and do what your teacher asks you to do um, because you're grateful to that person because of what they've done. Yeah, so you don't want to keep receiving, receiving, receiving and then be ungrateful and say, well, you know, you're just here to teach me when, it, when I feel like being taught, but don't ask anything of me. You know, that's not a proper attitude to have towards somebody who is uh, giving us the greatest kindness in the world, which is the teachings. You know, so our, in that way, our spiritual mentors are kinder to us than our parents, than our best friends, than anybody else, because none of those other people can lead us on the path. Okay, so... Teachers have a special place, and they help us in a special way. And, you know, it's important that we feel grateful for that and that we want to offer service to the teacher and help with whatever virtuous projects they're doing, okay? But it doesn't mean that, that uh, you see eye to eye on everything. Yeah, I remember um, one time Sangdom Rinpoche, who... He, was, he used to be the prime minister of uh, the Tibetan government in exile. He's an incredible uh, monk. 
And he was talking about his relationship with His Holiness because they're very, very close. And they had to work together when Sangdan Rinpoche was the, the prime minister. They had to work together to formulate policies and things like that. And Rinpoche said uh, that, you know, he would really listen closely to what His Holiness said and His Holiness's ideas. But when he disagreed with them, he would say so in a polite, respectful way, yeah. But he was able to voice it, and he said then that way, because uh, he felt that by offering a different viewpoint and different advice, uh, they could work together and formulate a policy that would be better than just one of them working alone, okay? So he, he would, you know, disagree on certain things of the policy, how to work with the communist Chinese, with His Holiness, but he, you could see from the way he talked, he had total 100% reverence for, for His Holiness. You know, there wasn't any kind of uh, friction or negativity at all. Yeah. And then you look at Lama Atisha and his guru Sir Lingpa, yeah, uh, who was one of Lama Atisha's most precious teachers, because Sir Lingpa taught him bodhicitta, okay? But Sir Lingpa had the Chitta Madra viewpoint, and Atisha had the Madhyamaka viewpoint, and Madhyamaka view is considered higher than Chitta Madra. So you can imagine the debates they had over the view of emptiness, which is something important. It's more important than whether you drink Tibetan tea or not, or what time you start the teachings, or, you know, these kinds of things. It's much more important. And uh, yet they would have these um, amazing debates. And yet the reverence that Tisha had for Sir Lingpa was unbelievable. You know, it, it was just, I mean, he just appreciated him and respected him and was grateful, uh, you know, without any kind of doubt in his mind. Okay? So, um, yeah. So, so see things like that. Don't don't feel like, uh, you know, like one of my teachers. He thought George Bush W was a great president. You know, okay. And Geshe-la is going. Oh, you know, he loved George Bush. Why? Because George Bush talked about human rights in Tibet. You know, other other presidents necessarily didn't necessarily talk about that, but that was, of course, something incredibly important to my teacher. Yeah, he didn't care that that Bush sent troops into Iraq unnecessarily. Yeah, what he cared about was that you know he talked to China about human rights. Yeah. And so I remember being with with an, another disciple, the two of us nuns, kind of looking and like he thinks George Bush is a great president, like you know. <laughs> but at the same time, you know, Geshe-la was a perfect teacher. I mean, incredible, amazing teacher. I studied with him since 1977. 77, 76, sometime around there. Incredible teacher. But I, I went to learn Dharma from him. I didn't lo learn to go, go to learn politics. Yeah? So he has his political opinions. I have my political opinions. That's okay. Yeah? I don't have to say somebody's bad. I don't have to say they're wrong. I don't have to get hooked on uh, this thing of in order to be uh, harmonious, we have to believe the same things. Okay, In a marriage, yeah, are, are you going to have the same opinions on everything as your spouse? No. Okay. So does that mean you're going to get divorced? In a in a couple relationship, that there are things you're not going to be able to change, and you have to accept about the other person, 
And if you don't accept them, you're going to quarrel, you're going to be miserable, you're not going to appreciate any of their good qualities. And instead of all the things that you can cooperate on and do well together, you focus on the one thing that you disagree in. You know? So if your mind works like that, you're not going to have a very good relationship. But if you just say, okay, people have different ideas. Yeah, and we don't have to say one's right and one's wrong. I mean, look at Kellyanne and George. Yeah? Everybody know about the latest gossip about Kellyanne? Kellyanne Conway, who is one of Trump's advisors, and George Conway, her husband, who writes all sorts of things against Trump and publicly criticizes him. And she thinks Trump is great. And they're married. Yeah. So just imagine breakfast at the Conway table. <laughs> yeah. But somehow they find a way to work it, you know, so that they can still appreciate some qualities about each other and remain married. At least now, you know, we'll see what happens. Okay? Yeah? Thank you. That is so helpful. Um, I don't know if this is the proper form to uh, ask about um, what the accusations were against uh, a Rinpoche uh, who was accused of sexual um, mm -hmm. abuse. And then I saw the petition that um, mm -hmm. the monastics or, you know, nuns or and lay people, I think, made mm -hmm. um, to have a fair and balanced um uh, investigation, mm -hmm. and then Lama Zopa Rinpoche's advice about his view of Rinpoche as a wholly pure being, mm -hmm. and how to sort of see that in um, a okay. good way. Okay, so I was one of the, the people that supported having a, an impartial investigation. Rinpoche says there's no need for one, because he's a holy being, there's nothing to investigate. So that's one of the issues where Rinpoche and I have different opinions on something. Yeah, he's still my teacher. He's an incredible master. I really respect him. And we just have different opinions on this issue. That's all. Yeah, so I'm not angry, you know, and so on. Um, I, I should say that uh, those of us who are asking for an impartial investigation are not assuming that the Rinpoche in question is guilty. We actually think that for the sake of Buddhism in the West, uh, you know, that an impartial investigation is really important. You know, as we can learn from the, the Catholic Church, you know, conservative uh, institutions don't want to, to air their laundry publicly because they're concerned that it will make people lose faith. Yeah. But I think now, especially after the Me Too movement and after the discovery of the amount of um, sexual abuse of young kids in the Catholic Church, I think the dynamic is totally different. And if you don't have, if you don't air the issue out publicly, then people will lose faith. So it's completely the opposite as when, as it used to be. That's my opinion, yeah. So that's one of the reasons why I think, you know, if he's if he didn't do it, that's great, you know. If he did do it, we have to deal with it. But in any case, uh, I think it's good for Buddhism to be, you know, for our institutions to be transparent. Yeah, in that way. Okay. Okay, shall we see what Nagarjuna has to say? I can't even remember what verse we're on. What verse are we on? <laughs> what, 43? Okay. Yeah, every day I brought this, and, you know, I never even turned it on. <laughs> but you guys have really good questions, and, and I think you're investigating things that are important. Okay. <laughs> 
Yes. Hi. Sorry, I just want to stay on Guru Devotion just one more second, if that's mm-hmm. okay. Sure. So I, res- I hear you saying the idea that, you know, with your, with your significant other that you can have, um, an, it's an equal relationship, but your relationship with your guru isn't equal. Mm-hmm. And so when I find myself um, having a disagreement or a, an opinion that's different, mm-hmm. um, the chatter in my head, if you will, is it's you my feel ego, guilty. my afflictive emotions, my... And then when he says, you know, when I say, I'm not feeling good about this. Who's mm-hmm. not feeling good about this? Where are you not feeling good about this? And then I get lost. Mm. Okay. Well, he, he says you're not feeling good about it, or you're saying that? I'm saying I'm you're not feeling good that. about this, or this is not sitting right with me. Like, Yeah. Okay. So, you know, the Buddha said right from the get-go, not to accept things blindly, but to question them and investigate them. Okay? So we can question and investigate and still respect the person whose speech we are questioning and investigating. So you may hear something in the teachings that really hits you funny and, you know, how in the world can the Buddha say that? Then you have to investigate. Do I understand? Am I understanding what the Buddha said correctly? Because maybe all that turmoil inside of me is because I'm not understanding actually what the Buddha said. Okay? Or I'm not understanding what the Buddha meant. Or maybe I'm in turmoil because one of my buttons is getting pushed. In which case I need to sit and work it out. Yeah? But these things, of course, they come up. You don't uh, need to feel guilty. You need to recognize, okay, you know, there's a difference here, and I need to look deeply and figure out kind of what I believe, okay, and what makes sense to me. Let me give you another example, okay? So, I grew up believing in God, yeah? And, of course one of the big things you're supposed to do is please God, right? Yeah, you're supposed to please God. So, of course, you're not quite sure what all the rules are on how you're supposed to please, but anyway, you're supposed to please God. So there's one line in the the succession guru yoga that is talking about the guru that says, may I always do only what pleases you. Well, that line did not sit with me because I said, this is like, you know, when I learned in Sunday school, you're supposed to please God, but you don't know what all the rules are. And, you know, am I supposed to do some tap dance, uh, you know, so that God, you know, my guru likes me, but, but I don't, I don't want to do a tap dance so that I please somebody. I want to be able to be straightforward. And so it really, this line just drove me crazy. And I thought, if that's the way I have to relate to my teacher, you know, this is is horrible, you know. So finally, what I figured out, yeah, because I had to really sit with that line a long time. And it's like, okay, if that line is setting me off so much because I don't agree with it, then something's wrong in my understanding because the Buddha would not give a teaching that has the purpose of making somebody so anxious and guilty and so on. Yeah, that the Buddha would never, ever make a teaching that would, with the intention that that's that's how the recipient understood it and how they emotionally responded. So I said, I must, you know, I need to really think about this and what could the Buddha possibly have meant when he said, you know, regarding the spiritual mentor, may I do only what pleases you. So what the conclusion I came to over a long period of time was that 
They say that the Buddha cares more about sentient beings than we care about ourselves. And that the Buddha cares more about sentient beings than he cares about himself. So what makes Buddha the happiest is when sentient beings create virtue and create the causes for happiness. That is what delights the Buddha and pleases the Buddha more than anything because he wants to see sentient beings be happy and peaceful. So I understood, oh, when I say, may I do only what pleases you, it means, may I create virtuous actions that bring about happiness for myself and others. Now that I am in total agreement with. Yeah, that's what, I'm, that's what I want to do in my practice. Okay? So you can see how I initially uh, uh, felt about that line was incorrect, and I had to change how I understood that line, and then it made perfect sense, and I agreed with it. Okay? Um, yeah, so there, there's that kind of thing. And also to realize that uh, we're dealing cross-culturally. Yeah? So there's things that are fine in Tibetan culture that don't go with us, there's things that, that go with us that don't go with them. You know, when young, when young husbandsmen marched into Lhasa in, I think it was 1906, all around the Lingkor, the, you know, the long rockway, the Tibetans were standing and they were all clapping as his army wa walked by. And he thought... They're clapping because they're welcoming us because they think that we're freeing them from, you know, this horrible government that they had. What they didn't understand was in Tibetan culture, you clap to scare away the spirits. Yeah, so they weren't clapping because they loved young husband's men and his army. They were clapping to scare these guys away. Okay? So... You know, there's so much opportunity for for misunderstanding. Thank you. I think the line that um, really catches my breath is, do nothing to disturb your llama's mind. Yeah. And that's, um, I'm scared to raise something because I don't want to upset him. Not from a fearful place, but from that, I don't want to create friction or tension mm -hmm. or be banished from my sangha because I have a different idea or my yeah. community. Yeah. So it, it, the thing is, you know, disturbing your teacher's mind. Are you doing something that is just totally obnoxious and disrespectful? You know? Okay, if, you, if you're being obnoxious and disrespectful and you're creating disharmony because you really don't like these people in the Dharma Center and you want them out because you want to do the job and get those people out of here and, you know, I want the power, then please, you know, that, that's not so good. That's going to disturb the mind. But if you just have an idea that you want to share... Or if you see something that maybe needs to be addressed, you can say it in a very respectful tone and bring it up and say, you know, I, I think I just want to say this with, with all due respect. I just want to give you this little bit of information. Yeah? And you don't need to feel guilty. So the whole thing really is watch your mind and what your motivation is. Yeah, and if you want to like, like, fight, if you're trying to create, um, if your own mind is troubled, then you know, and then you know there's affliction. Okay? So if, you know, you're agitated, you're angry, you're fed up, you can't stand it anymore, there's affliction present. 
So you need to work with your mind and calm down okay, before you say anything. But if it's just you're looking at something and, uh, you know, I mean, you, and you just need to give a piece of information, then you don't need to, to get so worried about it. Yeah. You see, our problem is every time somebody disagrees with us, we think they're criticizing us. And that's not true. You know, every time somebody asks us to do, a, do something <clears throat> or, uh, or whatever, it, it doesn't mean we're failures and they're, we're criticizing, you know. So, for example, yeah, there's one lady, this is an incredible story, I won't tell you the whole story, but she sends a box of uh, fresh fruit and vegetables to us every two weeks because she lives in Ka Qatar? What? You? Abu Dhabi. Abu Dhabi. Okay. So she can't... It's, it's in the Middle East. Okay? So she orders the food and, and they send it. Okay? So it arrives and uh, the guy brings it and our usual policy is we take packages into Ananda. You know? Because there's one person whose duty it is to keep, you know, monitor the packages, put them away, write thank you notes, and so on. Okay, now, if you take a box, and, and that person doesn't check everything every day, but so if you have a, a box of fresh fruits and vegetables, and you bring it into Ananda, you know, well, it could sit there for two or three days. What's going to happen to the fresh fruits and vegetables in the meantime? Ooh. Okay, so then you have to say something to the person who brought the box in, who was thinking, I'm just following our policy. Yeah, and you have to say something. You, you want, you know, maybe you want to say, look, think about it. Are you going to put fresh strawberries in Ananda? Take them to the kitchen. My God, can't you think about anything constructively, you jerk? Okay, so... If you're thinking like that, and that's what you want to say, better keep your mouth closed, okay? But if you're, if you're thinking, you know, oh, that person probably did it because that's the policy. They weren't thinking about it. And so I just need to remind them every time a box comes and it says from farm something, farm box, farm box or the box says Whole Foods on it, and, you know, any box like that, take it to the kitchen and just make a note of who sent it so they can get properly thanked. Okay? So there's two ways of giving that person the information. One, you could be angry and insulting. Another, you just give them the information and it's done. Okay. Now, if that person who hears it is super sensitive, then anything you say, they're going to say, oh, you're criticizing me because you think I'm an idiot. Well, no, you're just giving them that little bit of information. It's such a drag to deal with people who are so sensitive. But I know none of you are like that. <laughs> yeah, none of us are unreasonably sensitive to anything. Yeah, it's all these other people. Yeah. So those things happen. So then you just have to deal with them. But you know in your own heart that you weren't trashing somebody and you weren't insulting somebody. It's just they needed to have a certain piece of information. And they misunderstood. And what can you do? You know, maybe you explain to them your motivation. Maybe they still don't accept it, and they still think that you're persecuting and out to get them. Then you just say, what to do? Yeah? Mm -hmm. We are going to get to Nagarjuna. <laughs> maybe. Um, <laughs> yeah. I just want to insert my own little PSA. Uh, <laughs> I know every time we mention something online, or you all mention something online, there's suddenly a whole bunch of them showing up in the mail. 
Oh. Um, it is really not environmentally friendly to be sending food and, and packages. Yeah. Um, it, it takes a lot of extra packaging, and you guys have a food fund on your donations page. Yes. But it's still so meritorious to send Oh, he's things. criticizing us! Oh! Can't you hear the sarcasm in his voice? I totally agree with you. In fact, we had a discussion last week, uh, and we decided that it's much better instead of when we need supplies, like for the computer or whatever, instead of ordering them online and having them delivered here, that we just need to add them to the errand list so that somebody purchases them when they go to town so that we don't have uh, waste so much gas with the UPS and all the paper and cardboard. Yeah. But the thing is, from Abu Dhabi, yeah, because, you know, somebody, they, they like to order it, they like, they like to pick out what they want to send to you. Okay, they have the idea that here's this box and then they know it's me. They don't want it to be mixed in with everybody else's thing. Okay, so, it, you know, there's many considerations when we're dealing with, with donors and volunteers. But I agree with you completely about trying to uh, minimize waste. Yeah. Okay, so in 42, we talked about... Uh, Virtuous and non-virtuous karma and factors that make it heavy. Okay. Then 43 says, A pinch of salt can give its salty taste to a little water, but not to the Ganges River. So know that, likewise, minor evil deeds can never change a mighty source of good. So this is in response to a question that arises. When somebody who in general keeps very good ethical conduct makes a mistake is the karma they're creating heavier because uh, they had to overcome more in their own mind to have that negative motivation be acted out so is that action heavier or is their action lighter because, in general, they're creating virtue and this was a slip-up? Okay? So there's arguments on both sides for that, the answer to that question. But Nagarjuna seems to be saying here that it's, it's not as heavy because the amount of virtue in that person's mental continuum, you know, is huge. So... A small, you know, he mentions here minor evil deeds. So it's not a major thing. I mean, if somebody breaks a root precept, that's a big deal. But here it's a minor thing. So it's, it's not going to be a big thing because there's so much virtue in their mind already. Okay, so it's like salt in the Ganges River. Whereas if you put a little bit of salt in, in a bottle cap, that water is going to be real salty. So for a person who doesn't uh, create a lot of merit, then, uh, you know, each negative deed really adds, you know, adds into it. Okay, 44. And here I changed some of the terms um, to correspond to how I usually translate things. Restlessness and regret and malice and lethargy and sleepiness and sensual desire and deluded doubts are hindrances. Please know these five are thieves that steal the gems of virtuous deeds. So when we talk about uh, hindrances to develop serenity, yeah, Maitreya has one list of five faults. They're called faults, not hindrances. But in both the Pali and Sanskrit traditions, there's a list of five hindrances. Okay, And so these five uh, interfere with our developing concentration, and we really need to work on them uh, in our, you know, to meditate. But they also 
interfere with our ethical conduct. Okay, so they're, they're, yeah, they're quite problematic things. Okay, so there's five of them. In two cases, there's two put together. Okay, and here they're in an order that isn't the usual order. Okay, the usual order is first sensual desire. Yeah, so here it's the last one in the second line. But that's usually the first one because, uh, you know, like we've been talking, our lives revolve around sensual desire, don't they? I want this, I want that, I want a pleasant experience with this, I want a happy feeling with that. We're glued to objects of the senses. So that is a hindrance to our to creating virtue because running after sense objects, we lie, we steal, we do all sorts of stuff. And it's also a hindrance in our concentration because we sit down to meditate on the Buddha or Manjushri, you know, the image of Manjushri, and instead, you know, what's going through our mind is, okay, Manjushri's yellow, so we start thinking of, uh, you know, a yellow shirt or a yellow dress we store, it's on a store that's really good, or we think of the yellow Trump balloon, and, you know, oh, those people in Britain, they really have it, but Britain, and then we're off, but Britain is really a mess, and they want to exit the EU, and that's such a stupid thing to do, and why did they have that election to start with, and how come they can't have an, another election? And then, you know, you're, you're off and running. Okay, so sensual desire is a big problem uh, when we're trying to develop concentration in our meditation. Yeah. Okay, the second one is malice, which is the, uh, the last one in the first line, line, okay? And malice means uh, you're planning your revenge. You have, uh, it's also translated as ill will. So you really have ill will. You, you wish somebody harm, you know? It's like, may that person fall flat on their face. May they be embarrassed, you know. I'm so glad that this guy got arrested, or, you know. Does, do you know how we have negative thoughts about people sometimes? <laughs> sometimes. A lot, you know. But, uh, but this is it. So this is obviously a hindrance in our ethical conduct. It's a hindrance when we're trying to meditate, too. Yeah, so you're trying to focus on Manjushri, and then, you know, you go from the yellow of Manjushri to the Trump balloon to this, like, how in the world did this guy get election, elected, and blah, 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 and everything he does is wrong, and everything he touches is contaminated. And, you know, and that's, that's totally uncalled for. We can't say anybody's all wrong and totally corrupt and everything, but we get off and running, and on that kind of thing, yeah. And the end result is, he's so bad, I should be president. Yeah. Do you want to be president? Yeah. I wouldn't want to be president. Yeah. So if I don't want to take the job, I need to, you know, have some compassion for some guy who does have the job. Okay. So, uh, sensual desire. Second was malice. Third, I think third is lethargy. Huh? Is it restlessness? I can't remember. It's restlessness and, 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 and regret. They're third, and then the, the lethargy and sleepiness is fourth, and doubt is fifth. Okay, so restlessness and regret. Restlessness, sometimes people translate it as excitement, or agitation, what it means is your mind is restless and it's kind of going towards attachment and an, an object of attachment's going to arise pretty soon, but it hasn't yet. You know, you're kind of dissatisfied and restless and, okay. And then the one that goes with it is regret. Yeah, so there's two kinds of regret. One is virtuous, one is non-virtuous. The virtuous one is when we regret our misdeeds. 
The non-virtuous one is when we regret our virtue. Okay? But the reason that restlessness and regret are put together is in both cases the mind is unsettled. When there's regret, we feel, I should have done something I didn't do. Why didn't I do that? Or we feel, I did something I shouldn't have done. Why? I, I, it was so stupid of me, you know? Okay? But it's like restlessness. The, the mind is it's agitated. It's not peaceful. So, again, it disturbs ethical conduct. It disturbs our everyday living. It disturbs our concentration. Hmm? Okay, then the fourth one, these here again, we have two put together, lethargy and sleepiness. So lethargy is your mind is dull. It's, you know, it kind of, yeah, it feels heavy. It's not clear at all. Yeah. And you don't really want to do anything about it, but you, you might kind of try to, okay? Uh, so that happens when we're meditating. It happens during our life. We're lethargic. And then sleepiness is, uh, is lethargy, you know, an, an increase in lethargy where you're really drowsy and, you know, you're, you're starting to go off. Yeah. So clearly that's, you know an obscuration in our meditation, and it's also problematic if you're driving, if you're working at the computer, you know, or, or doing anything else that, that requires focus. And then the fifth one is uh, diluted doubt here, okay? So there's different kinds of doubt. Yeah, there's one doubt that is like curiosity, that's really good, that helps you learn. There's another doubt that's inclined towards the right decision or the right view, but it's not certain. Then there's a doubt that is split between the, the correct one and the incorrect one. But this one is the doubt that is inclined towards the wrong conclusion. So it's not yet a wrong view, but it's going in that direction. Okay, and so clearly diluted doubt in our practice in general is a big hindrance because then you go, you know, I got these instructions on how to develop uh, serenity, but I don't know if they're correct, you know, because I hear from different traditions, these different ways of developing serenity, so maybe that one's better, maybe this one better but I don't really understand it, but should I be practicing serenity at all? You know, maybe I should do it like 100% of my meditation, but maybe I shouldn't do any of it, or, you know, what what should I really be practicing? Uh, what teacher do I want to follow? What vehicle am I following? You know, I like Dharma, but what in the world is Dharma? Uh, you know, so... The mind, you know how it is, yeah? So this kind of deluded doubt that is always going in the wrong direction that gets us completely tied up in knots. Yeah? Okay. So these five are thieves that steal the gem of virtuous deeds. Yeah? So they're thieves because they prevent us from creating virtue and they prevent us from developing concentration and they prevent us just from being a happy functioning individual yeah because when these three are running around in our mind we don't function very well day to day yeah kind of the restlessness and regret then it grows into panic attacks yeah so okay so that's 44 then 45, he's pointing out some good ones here that we want to uh, practice. So with faith, <clears throat> effort, and mindfulness, and concentration, uh, wisdom, five in all, you must strive hard to reach the highest state. As powers, these forces take you to the peak. 
Okay, so the highest state full is fully awake, full enlightenment. These five, okay, in uh, when you talk about they're they're in both the Pali tradition and the Sanskrit tradition. They apply to bo- to people who are shravakas or hearers, to solitary realizers, and to bodhisattvas. And and there's a set called the Thirty Seven Harmonies with Awakening. Okay, and the 37 harmonies of awakening are subdivided into seven sets. So you have the four, uh, the four establishments of mindfulness, the four um, striving, hmm? yeah, the four supreme strivings, the four, um, sometimes they, um, Sometimes people call it miraculous powers, um, spiritual powers, or spiritual attainments. Okay. Then you have the five forces, the five um, powers, the seven awakening factors, and the eight po- eightfold path. Okay. So you have those seven sets that com- comprise the thirty-seven. And if you add four, 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 five, five, seven, eight together, you get thirty-seven. Okay, and they're called sometimes uh, they're translated as wings or facets of enlightenment. I like harmonies of enlightenment. Okay, but the point is that these five faith, effort, mindfulness, concentration, or wisdom, they are the five forces. And when they get further developed, then they become the five powers. Okay, so they are actually two sets of the seven sets that comprise the 37 uh, harmonies with enlightenment. Yeah, that are part of the three higher trainings that are described in the Four Noble Truths. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so if you didn't like math, you're going to like it now. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So faith we talked about before, why it's important, you know, because it gets us going in the right direction and it sustains us. It leads to aspiration. Yeah, it leads us to aspire for something and, you know, and it leads us to make effort to get what we value, okay, which is the second one, effort. Yeah, so again, you know, whatever we want to attain, we have to exert effort. Yeah, when they talk about the, the 37, you know, these 37, effort comes up many, many times. So does mindfulness, yeah, okay. So, effort, we have to have sustained practical effort, not pushing ourselves so that we become exhausted, yeah, uh, but just doing something consistently at a level that we can handle and nudging ourselves just a little bit, not pushing ourselves, but nudging ourselves um, because sometimes we have a self-image that doesn't give ourselves enough credit for what we're capable of doing. Okay? So effort is needed to, uh, you know, encourage ourselves so that we don't keep shooting ourselves in the foot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then mindfulness is the third one. So here, mindfulness is remembering what's important. And it's also, mindfulness has an element of wisdom. It investigates things. It, uh, yeah, you know, when we talk about the four mindfulnesses of body, feelings, mind, and phenomena, uh, that mindfulness isn't just a neutral observer. It's actually investigating, you know. How do the how are these things work? Yeah. And it's and it's geared towards gaining wisdom. Yeah. So it's not just, oh yeah, I'm mindful, I'm watching the fan turn. No, that's not that. Okay. 
So mindfulness is the third of the five. Concentration. Yeah, we need concentration. That comes again and again and again in Buddhist practice because if we can't concentrate, we can't really uh, uh, make strong change in the mind that's going to stay. And then wisdom we need so that we have the right views and we go in the right direction. It's one place where the Pali and the Sanskrit traditions vary about this thing about that has an element of wisdom. Because I think Bhikkhu no. Bodhi talks about that for the Sampajana. Yeah. But, or do but they both, maybe? But when you do the four establishments of wisdom, because mind, four establishments of mindfulness, mindfulness can, can mean slightly different things in different situations. Okay? So when you're doing the practice of the four establishments of mindfulness, then you really want to couple your mindfulness with wisdom. Okay? Yeah? And Samprajana, too, you know, that's the one we translate as introspective awareness. Yeah? So that one can just monitor the mind, but it can also, you know, serves the function of, you know, is what's going on in my mind beneficial or not? Okay? Okay, then 46. <clears throat> so here's... <laughs> Somebody thinking, I'm not beyond my karma, the deeds uh, I've done. I will still fall ill, age, die, and leave my friends. Think like this again and yet again, and with this remedy, avoid all arrogance. Okay, so when we tend to get arrogant, you know, like we can be arrogant about our youth, I'm young and healthy and I can do so many things and all these old ones can't do that. Mm -mm. You know, where we get ar arrogant about our appearance. Oh, I'm so attractive. Everybody likes me because I'm attractive. Or arrogant about our intelligence. I am so witty and clever and bright. Or, you know, we can get arrogant about anything. Yeah, I have the best fox terriers in the world, you know, with the <laughs> cutest faces. Or I have the, they have a contest for the ugliest dog. I have the ugliest dog. You see, he won, he won a medal. You know, I'm the owner of the ugliest dog. Well, congratulations. <laughs> you are indeed special. Um, <laughs> okay, so we can get arrogant about anything very easily. So, when we get arrogant, yeah, there's different antidotes. Here's one that's very good to think. I'm not beyond my karma, the deeds that I've done. So, I'm going to experience the results of the actions that I've created in the past. And I have no idea of all the actions I've done in the past. I'm a being in samsara. They say that I've done everything so for sure there's going to be a lot of seeds of destructive actions on my mind stream. Nothing to get all puffed up about that because they're going to ripen and, you know, bring their suffering result. And, uh, you know, and so you see people who are so arrogant and then they go kerplunk, don't they? Yeah? Yeah. Um, you, you can see that. I mean, I'm sorry if I talk about people in the news, but they're good examples that we're all aware of. Look at Paul Manafort. You know? Very, you know, I'm connected with all these important Russian oligarchs and the guys in, in Ukraine, and I'm Trump's campaign manager, and I'm this and I'm that, and I have all these houses and so much money. And now... You know, he has, what, a seven-year holiday in prison. And the government um, took some of his houses and his wealth. Yeah. So, you know, we get ourselves all puffed up, but we create actions in this life and also in, in previous lives that could ripen and then, you know, everything falls apart really quickly. So there's nothing to be all puffed up about because this could happen to us. 
Yeah. Then in addition, yeah, I will still fall ill because unless we die first, we're going to get sick. You know, people always go to the 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 fortune teller, you know, kind of and they're, you know, the fortune teller, they pay such good attention because the fortune teller is talking about me. And the fortune teller says, in the next year, you're going to get sick. And we go, oh my goodness, I'm going to get sick. I better do a lot of virtuous practice, better do my medicine, do Buddha practice. Uh, you know, be generous, be kind, you know, because fortune teller said I'm going to get sick. Okay. Actually, you know, I'm not a fortune teller, but I feel pretty secure in telling you you're going to get sick next year. <laughs> because I know for myself, I don't go one year without getting sick. Do any of you go a year without the cold, a cold or the flu? Really? You go more than a year without a cold or the flu? Well, you just shot down my arrogance. <laughs> I thought I was this great fortune teller, you know. But unfortunately for me, I don't go a year without getting a cold or the flu. You know, every year, at least one, sometimes two. Okay. So my, my point is, we listen to the fortune teller and create virtue. But if we just think about it ourselves, we could, you know, kind of see the same thing. And it would be a lot cheaper than being the fortune teller, but not nearly as interesting. Okay. So we will still fall ill. We age that one, don't tell me you don't have every year. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that one, I know you have every year. <laughs> okay. Uh, we fall ill, we age, and we leave our friends. We become separated from our friends. Maybe not in the next year, but for sure when we die. Yeah. And now, the guy I was telling you about this morning, all these people who worked out that deal for him 10 years ago that was such an easy thing, they're all saying other things about him now. And all of his friends listed in his little book are all distancing themselves from him right now. Okay? So, yeah, we leave our friends. We separate from people. So think like this again and, and yet again. And with this remedy, uh, avoid all ignorance, arrogance, and ignorance. But uh, yeah, so just to be aware of what our situation in samsara is and not get so arrogant and think we're, you know, so, so fantastic when we're always we're st and we're still subject to the vagaries of, of samsara. Forty-seven. If higher rebirth and freedom, freedom here meaning liberation from samsara, are your quest, you must become accustomed to right views. Those who practice good with pervade, perverted views will yet experience terrible results. Okay, so if your spiritual aim is to have uh, a good rebirth in your next life and even lifetimes after that, or your, re your spiritual quest is liberation, yeah, and for awakening too, it's not just limited, uh, limited to those two, then, yeah, we must become accustomed to right views. If we don't have right views, then we're lacking wisdom. If we don't have right views, our meditation is faulty. We're not going to get anywhere. If we don't have right views, we may act unethically, thinking that our actions are virtuous. Okay? So we can get 
in a lot of trouble by having uh, wrong views. Okay? Okay, that's what I was just going to give. <laughs> so, examples of wrong views are saying uh, there's no such thing as karma and its effects. Yeah? I can do whatever actions I want. They have no ethical dimensions. Yeah? And uh, unless the police find out I'm not going to, about my naughty deeds, I'm not going to experience any adverse effects. Okay? So I'll just do whatever I want. That's a very dangerous view. Yeah? It's a nihilistic view that negates the ethical dimension or ethical cause and effect. And then through that, we give ourselves permission to do all sorts of negative deeds. Okay? Another um, example would be denying the existence of Buddha, Dharma, and Sangha. Yeah? Or denying the existence of uh, awakening and Buddhahood. Yeah? Oh, sentient beings are hardwired to be selfish. There's no way to overcome our selfishness. Yeah, we're always going to be selfish. So, you know, this idea of a fully perfected Buddha who, who cherishes others more than himself is a hokey dokey. Okay? So that's a wrong view. If you think like that, then you're never going to practice the path going to Buddhahood. Okay? Or another wrong view is... Uh, Oh, emptiness means that nothing exists at all. Everything is a dream. Not like a dream, but is a dream. So all, the, all of you are dreams. So if I punch you in the face, nobody gets hurt because you're all just made, you know, you're just dreams. Yeah. So uh, another, another wrong view is things are definitely inherently existent. Now, yeah. so meditation on em emptiness is stupidity. Yeah, because things in exist inherently with their own essence. No doubt about it. Okay? So, um, if you have those kind of wrong views, you're not going to be able to progress on the path. Yeah? So it isn't just actions. It's thoughts. And we can see that having the wrong kind of thoughts can sometimes be worse than doing bad actions. In the case of the ten non-virtues, they say wrong view, which is the last one, and it's uh, a non-virtue of the mind. They say that one is the worst. It's worse than killing. Initially, I thought, how is that one worse than killing? Because if you have the wrong view that there's no karma and effects, or that people are simply dreams, and so nobody really gets hurt if you punch them or kill them, or you have the wrong view that uh, animal sacrifice will please the gods. Yeah. So if you have any of those kind of wrong views, they're going to motivate you to do really heavy physical and verbal negativities. Okay. So you must become accustomed to right views. Now line three. Those who practice good with perverted views will yet experience terrible results. So these people, maybe the actions they do look good, but their minds are still overwhelmed by wrong views. Okay? And so the wrong views will create, you know, bad motivations, bad intentions, and uh, so even though the action may look good, uh, it's supported by, you know, a perverted way of thinking. 
Mm -hmm. So uh, let, let's think of an example. Mm. I think I'll give, I'll practice generosity. I will give a huge donation to this presidential candidate. And when they get elected, then I will get a cabinet position. So I did this good deed of being extremely generous. But my view is perverted, isn't it? Okay. Okay. So I think we're going to stop here today. And so it says, so people who do that will yet experience terrible results. Yeah. Because our intention is one of the major uh, factors in the karma we create. Okay, so we'll take, we'll do, tomorrow morning we'll do Nagarjuna. Okay.